Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? We'll be uh, joined by Ryan here in just a sec. Ryan Chow is in the house. What's up, Craig? Can everybody hear us? <laughs> as soon as we get confirmation. Can you hear me, Ryan? I can hear you. Yeah, I got you. What's up, Gina, Jenna, Diana. Laura? Oh my God, Florida's in the house. Nick is here from New York City. Happy birthday, Andre Nick. Kim is here from Seoul, South Korea. What is up? Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Somebody can just comment that they can hear us. So I'm looking at the comment section here. Uh, can it, anybody write in the comments that they can hear us? Can you tell, Ryan? They can hear you. They can? Yeah. Can everybody hear Ryan? Can everybody hear Ryan? Do you know Ryan if they can hear you? Oh, yeah. you can hear both of us. Gina from DC, welcome. All right, well, we are um, about to get started here. Uh, we promised two days ago we would uh, <laughs> we would test my, my uh, social media internet literacy here, which is pretty poor, um, and uh, <laughs> try to figure this out. How are you, Ryan? I'm good, man. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Everybody should know that Ryan's going to be even even gooder in a couple of days when he and uh, his girlfriend Tracy are off to Greece. Yes, sir. It's, where, uh, where, are you, where are you going in the Greek Isles? Santorini. Oh. Oh. I'm not allowed to bring my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> that is a smart woman. Tracy knows exactly. So uh, we got a few few dozen people here right now, and uh, we want to. We don't want you to just uh, use this time to listen to us chit chatting. Um, but uh, what we promised was that we we're going to talk about beliefs and reconceptualizing beliefs. Uh, we know how hard it is uh, to put knowledge into practice, take science and take facts, and use them to challenge the status quo. The status quo is like what we've been doing, best of intentions. Um, but uh, sometimes we have to update our priors. And what better time than as we put the pandemic in the rearview mirror, when we get back, that we don't get back to business as usual. That sound like a plan, Ryan? Yeah, I'm excited to talk about this. This is what I uh, spend every single day trying to chip away at. And, and uh, I'm excited to talk with uh, you about it and share with everybody from Australia to North America and, and everywhere. <laughs> well, we're blessed. You know, the pandemic did have a lot of uh, opportunities for creative destruction. And um, uh, sometimes you get shown the light in the strangest places if you look at it right, as Robert Hunter, the lyricist for The Grateful Dead, wrote um, a few decades ago. Um, and uh, we have to make the most of this opportunity. And we have to challenge ourselves. And one of the things we learned, we did the um, High Value Webinar Series for... Uh, 10 consecutive Sundays early on in the pandemic and had the, the blessing to be able to, uh, to meet many of you for the first time then that hadn't taken first principles of movement or Prague School to athletic development or modern spine care courses or various things that, that I've, I've introduced over, over um, uh, the past decades. And um, thank God, because I got it wrong so many times. So uh, I think during the pandemic, we've started to kind of collate things and realize some of our mistakes and, and really get in touch with the client's needs. And specifically, um, you know, what, what, what we were hearing a lot during the webinar series, and, and I think Ryan may, may chime in here in a sec, but we were hearing that people are, are concerned as, as professionals, as movement professionals, as coaches and clinicians, um, you know, what do you do when a person uh, is afraid if they do the exercise wrong, that, 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 that it'll be counterproductive? Or what about when they have pain? Like, like people associate hurt with harm, they're afraid of making it worse. 
um, not only because they do it incorrectly because they weren't supervised as far as form, but because uh, they feel that hurt equals harm. And, and when they feel sensitivity, they assume it's getting irritated. Um, and these were just two of the, uh, the things that people were asking us. There was other things that people were asking us too, but, but do you wanna share some of your thoughts uh, about, uh, about uh, those, two, those two keystones? Yeah, but Craig, real quick, um, I'm seeing messages that it's hard for people to hear you. Um, I think maybe the mic could be closer or maybe something loose. Okay, how, how is this now? Is that better? Thanks for the feedback, everybody. I just took off my uh, headset. I can hear you better, I think. Uh, let me hear back from everybody else. Uh. So, so let me uh, just reintroduce that. I want to reset the table here. During the High Value Webinar Series, um, thank you, uh, thank you uh, for those that are commenting. Uh, from the High Value Webinar Series, we were so blessed. We were so blessed to be able to be introduced to a lot of people that hadn't done our live courses over the years. Um, and even though uh, we've been teaching these courses in, in Korea and in Taiwan and in China and in Prague and in England and in Amsterdam and all over the North America, uh, the webinar series brought people together from all over the world. So for 10 consecutive Sundays, we were so fortunate to be able to sit for 90 minutes or longer and bring to you people like Nick Winkleman and Rachel Balkovec and Paula Silver and Lorimer Mosley and Peter Stowell and Matthew Lowe and others and share. And one of the things that we kept hearing was about this idea that, that Levitt had taught us, that rehab is, is teaching people what to do for themselves, um, that it's hard to implement this. And this is what First Principles Movement has been always about, is about knowledge translation. And uh, wow, we just had a, a tumbler here. We just had an earthquake in Southern California. So uh, breaking the status quo, challenging the status quo, shakes things up. And, and, and one of the things that we heard was people saying, well, clients are concerned with coaches or with clinicians that they don't want to make a mistake. Like, what if they do it wrong? They need to be supervised. You can't do it online and they need to be corrected and the form has to be insured. And the second thing was, well, what if it hurts? People believe hurt equals harm. They think if they have sensitivity that, that things are getting irritated. And those two things seem to derail the whole process. So, so as we were getting together, as I quoted Robert Hunter, we're so lucky to have all of you asking us these questions in the webinar series. And that's what became our FPM mentorship launched in August with people from 15 different countries, from, from seven different professions, so that we could look, things, look at things in a new light. As Robert Hunter, the lyricist for The Grateful Dead said, sometimes you get shown the light uh, uh, in the strangest places if you look at it right. And so we want to change angle of vision. We are all about challenging the status quo. That is our mission. Um, so, so Ryan, any thoughts on those, those two points about one, hurt equals harm, and then people decide they're not going to exercise. They need to lay flat on a table or take pills. Uh, or two, uh, they're afraid they're doing things wrong. And if they do things wrong, they're going to make things worse. So they don't even get started. Yeah, I think uh, going back to your, uh, the, the pandemic as being the catalyst for all this is, is we learned when we were forced to, to go to virtual and be away from people that, uh, you know, you, you have to learn the person, learn about the person in front of you, understand their environment. And then when they don't have the option of, of massage on the table or, or some sort of manual technique or modality, we're forced to teach, we're forced to uh, have people move and we're forced to do it in groups too. And um, uh, so much good came out of it because we realized that most of the time, if you don't get caught up in every every uh, little bump in the road that if you just keep pushing forward that things get better and you know it turns out the science has been there all along and if when and if when we had to stop and, and address someone's concern every time they had a pain it was another way for people to to veer off path kind of like what they teach you in business like if you make a person take the credit card every time that's another opportunity for them to like oh maybe i don't want to but if you're on subscription mode uh, you know, people just stay, they just stay bought in and you get to really make a change over a long term. So, so I think, um, I think that the pandemic was a blessing. I think virtual training, I think group training has all been a blessing that I've really tried to embrace with um, the team at Reload. Um, I think we've seen amazing results. I've seen such amazing messages and uh, the, some of the, the, the people in here can chime in about this too. Um, uh, the group is so much better. Uh, the camaraderie, the 
the uh, the achievement, the the community, the fun is all so much better than uh, tiptoeing around every single exercise and every single movement. It's like it just becomes this thing where we all deep down know inside that like you got to move. Like what's what's the quote that um, your mom always tells uh, that you always bring up? So this became sort of what I was known for in China. It became the icon for for first principles of movement. My mom said, if you want to move, and she's ninety two. If you want to move you gotta move. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, it's, I just love, yeah, I just love the energy of a group. I love how people learn from each other. They look, you know, there's so much implicit learning. You think about, you know, not to make it too sciencey, but you think about how much a cerebellum has to look at what's going on and adjust. You watch people learn from other people uh, just in the room, how they look when they're doing a kettlebell swing or how they look like when they approach the barbell or, um, you know, just having a, a people around you to, to watch after, uh, and not just your, your instructor. Sometimes your instructor is the most inspiring person in the world, but sometimes your instructor or your clinician is, is part of the problem, not, not because they're trying to be part of the problem or they are part of the problem, but they've become a crutch. So I, I love the idea of, of clinicians um, having, their, having patients work in, in groups or clients work in groups. And I love... Um, the idea of coaches relying on uh, clinicians to say, hey, actually, whatever you're, you're worried about, it's actually okay. I'm going to reassure you and keep pushing forward. It's going to be all right. I love that. And I think um, uh, it, ha it, it, it dovetails with one of the other things that we started to update our priors about during this, this period of reflection during the pandemic of creative destruction. Um, this, this concept that, um, that a lot of clinicians and even trainers trainers want to train people but they don't they don't send them home with anything to empower them um, they make them dependent just like clinicians can make people dependent uh, uh, trainers will give too many correctives that makes per a person more fragile more afraid of exercising independently um, clinicians use passive care that way um, not intentionally it's not unethical it's what we believe in and there's obviously a role for manual therapy as a catalyst but we want to transition into uh, supervised training one-on-one -on -one with a professional. And then like you're saying, segue that. So once we've reassured and reactivated them, we wanna segue them towards strengthening, getting under the bar, towards load, becoming better prepared, and then using a lot of different options, so variability. These are our four principles. And going into group really challenges a person's sense of self-efficacy, how empowered they are, um, uh, and and is the proof that they're no longer a fragilista when they don't feel like they have to do everything perfectly. And then this, something ironic happens, which is now they become the leader to somebody to their right or left. They now are empowering somebody else and they're like reassuring them like, hey, don't worry, you don't have to do it perfect. It takes time, you're gonna get better. Um, not every hurt equals harm. So community does a better job through peer support than a one-on-one -on -one trainer or a one-on-one -on -one clinician can do with a person. So this whole idea has pivoted from worrying about poor compliance and saying, I'm not gonna give somebody self-management because they're not gonna comply to let's achieve collaboration. And what better way to create collaboration than through community and building community and segueing people from one-on-one from -on -one into group, from clinician-centered to client-centered, from, from having a clinician work side-by-side -side with you to having a trainer work side by side with you. And now you're working side by side with peers, with other clients. This is building our, our community and empowering people. And, it, and, it, and it's echoed in an incredible podcast from JOSPT, Journal of Orthopedics and Sports Physical Therapy, just released like two days ago with one of my favorite experts in the world, Linda Trong, a PhD PT in Calgary uh, with Christine Lee, a collaborator of her, hers. And they're talking about group training, just like you were, Ryan. They're talking about um, how there are um, um, landmarks and they have divided their training into, into four levels. And what they do is they bring people in that all have different injuries. So there are universal standards, basic fundamental movement literacies that you can use. You don't have to be sports specific. You don't have to be injury specific. Like they said at Exos, um, uh, if you're a sedentary secretary or you're an elite athlete, we're gonna look at your squat the same way. 
And if there's a floor there, we're going to try to raise it. So what they've developed is they develop landmarks. And they talk about this in this podcast, which um, I've posted about. And you can, listen to, uh, you can listen to Linda and Christine talk about how they progress people, uh, what their uh, baselines are to go from level one to level two, level two, level three. And just as a, as a um, uh, kind of um, uh, view to the kill here, level four is where you're starting to do pivoting change of direction that's level four before that is more sagittal plane or frontal plane or transverse plane or it's pillar prep or it's mobility or it's balance or it's single leg uh but not until you get to level four is it combining things so there's change of direction which is also echoing the exos approach where you learn multi-planar not uniplanar but when do you put it all together well in the end yeah i, I love I love the idea of having uh, uh, baselines and then things to achieve. You you don't start running because it's eight weeks after your injury. You start running because you can tolerate first single leg calf strength and then double leg uh, plyometrics and then single leg plyometrics and then repeat efforts. And um, if, if everybody on the team, whether coach or clinician, understands the landmarks and the achievements that need to be acquired, then we can all work together to – to, uh, what's up, Harley? Uh, to, 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 to progress people towards their goals. And it's about the person in front of us, not about the program we want to force on people. It's not about the kettlebell. It's not about the, the barbell. It's not about, um, you know, just change of direction, but it's about getting the person from where they are, from where they need to be. And if we have, you know, uh, 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 an ability to communicate about those landmarks and about, uh, unlocking those achievements, then we can all work together and really do so much. And, and um, you know, what you were just saying was echoed by uh, Amber, who is a, a new grad, Cairo, who's in our mentorship right now, who said this, the group creates a sense of responsibility for the person in, in the, uh, you know, it, it's, it's the depend independence that we're trying to impart on people and what better way to graduate people and, and what sense of achievement, just like CrossFit did, like, hey, you finished these entry-level one-on-one stuff, now you're ready to join the group. That's the big achievement. Like, wow, now I can train with everybody else. And then now if that training is geared around landmarks, then we can say, hey, each person can can still train and work hard together, but it's about your own landmarks, about your own achievements. And and this way we can really, um, uh, really improve everybody, upgrade everyone together without – removing the the personal side of things but also getting the plus side of the community and i think i think that's the future i think that's i'm putting my eggs in that basket i'm seeing my friend paul here who i went to high school with who who's who told me about small group training years ago and he started a small group training class and i and i want to pick his brain and learn more from him because he's been running these groups for a while now and they do amazing they're they're um it's just amazing the the small groups and and uh, the group exercise well, that, that's really what it's all about. I, mean, I think we know, we realize you can't manage what you can't measure. So, so people want to know it's safe. And, and one of the things that, that we always talk about is finding a safe starting place for people. Um, we want to give people a positive experience with movement. And then we progress them, okay, to the hardest thing they do well that's related to their goals. Um, and so for uh, Christine and Linda, you know, this idea of criterion based group training in, in rehab, in athletic development or um, risk management. Um, to me, this is the sine qua non for not only sustainable athleticism, and they see a lot of like ACLs, a lot of college athletes, um, uh, but also for healthy longevity. And I know prior to the pandemic, that was a big pivot for us was realizing that what applied to the low back applied uh, to all areas of the body, all regions, shoulder, knee, et cetera, osteoarthritis, that, that the principles of musculoskeletal management for helping people become more functional again for, with low back issues, uh, we shouldn't silo and think shoulder and knee are that much different. Um, mm -hmm. Similarly, NCDs, non-communicable diseases, um, uh, which disable people. And we have an aging population. So we have more and more of this type two diabetes, heart disease, dementia, uh, obviously osteoarthritis and back pain, uh, fall, falls, frailty, sarcopenia, uh, all of these issues, they all come back to 
kind of the same fundamental things. We have as a society, we have become overweight. We have lost our strength. We're atrophying. Um, we've been told, because we're all getting scanned, that we have wear and tear. And so we're eating too much and we're moving too little. And then we're told that we're breaking down and we should learn to accept it. When in fact, it's not wear and tear, it's wear and repair. So that's sort of why we want to give people confidence, why we want to find a safe starting point. And I think, again, going back to Linda Trong and Christine Lee's uh, beautiful podcast, um, they speak about in group. Sometimes you have to go back to one on one. You may have a person who does have a very individualized situation. And we always want to be mindful of that without making them into a fragilista who says, well, I'm special. You know, sometimes there is a unique need. And so just like we were talking two days ago, Ryan, you said it at Reload in New York City and Union Square in Lower Manhattan, you progress people, you reassure and reactivate them with clinician supervision, one on one, and then you hand them off, you progress them for GPP, uh, for general physical preparation and building resilience and making them robust uh, to the, the trainer, to the coach, who after they've deployed uh, intensity, and, and increase the resistance. Uh, when the person hits a plateau, then they deploy variability in order to manage risk. Um, but if the person flares, they can go back to the clinician for reassurance and reactivation. And if they don't flare, they get onboarded to group. So this is like our, how our four principles, reassurance, reactivation, resilience, and risk management, they unspool, unspool in, an, in, in a gym slash clinic hybrid, like Josh Satterley says, environment. And it can go to virtual and it can go to group. Like, like you said, if I'm gonna invest my money, that's where I'm putting my money down. Because we can offer people a more sustainable, more scalable approach. Am I, am I, am I saying that? Am I being fair to what you were saying two days ago? Yeah, you nailed it. It's, it's... The thing is, training is for everybody, and, and that's why we have to make it sustainable. Right now, in my opinion, the fitness industry is, is, is aspirational and inspirational, but it's unapproachable for some people. And, and you know, if you're someone who has an exercise since gym class 40 years ago, or you're, you know, you've had cancer, and you, it's been eight years since you've worked out, and, you know, there's a lot of things that are very intimidating about the gym. Even, the, you know, my own clients, I don't feel comfortable walking into your gym sometimes but um uh, what's this other screen yeah. yeah i think i accidentally let somebody in well, <laughs> i don't know i'll, I'll figure out sure how to get rid of them i'm sorry uh it's all right but but uh, yeah training is for everybody. i told you i don't know what i'm doing here folks we are winging it keep going ryan it, no no it's a it's 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 not accessible and it's not approachable for everyone. We want to make it that. And how do we do that? It's what you talked about. You meet people where they are. What you're describing about, um, uh, you know, a flare. Someone has a flare uh, that you know they're not ready for the, the general prep of everybody else. Really, they are. It's just one or two patterns or one or two buckets need to be brought up to speed, and that's where the one-on-one -on -one plays a role. But but it reminds me of SPP versus you know sports specific versus general phys physical prep. It's really about general physical preparation, eighty to ninety percent of it, and and then you might need to sprinkle a little on top. And and I think I think it's the same thing with injuries. It's for the most part to prevent whether it's arthritis, a frozen shoulder, or you know uh, I don't know. The, Back, chronic low back pain for the most part we have to keep moving for the most part we have to train all the the general biomotor quality strength mobility power speed all these things to varying degrees for each person's goal but we still have to maintain them that just reminds me for sports specific almost always the low-hanging fruit for a person is that it's not that they need to throw the ball more or they need to sprint on the track more often it's they need to attack their weak links you're only as, as good as your weak link and that's where the clinician or the one-on-one -on -one specialist comes in but for the most part we all have the same parts the same needs and the same things we have to develop and and if if we can um have people who can specialize in recognizing what needs to be reactivated not what needs to be de-educated and then re-educated on which is the reassurance to, to ensure people that yes, it is okay to, to train this. Yes, it is okay. You're not, we didn't miss something and you're not going to cause more harm or you're not gonna make things worse by training, even if it hurts while you're doing it. 
a little bit or things like that, or you get soreness. And then from the training perspective, you know, we want to make sure everyone's training all the qualities through the year. It's not just about the kettlebell. It's not just about the barbell. And if you do that all the time, you need someone to give you the vision that says, hey, you know, you've done this kettlebell for, you know, 62 weeks straight. Maybe that's why, <laughs> maybe that's why your elbow hurts because, you know, it's, it's a plyometric for your elbow. And maybe you just need to do some some upper body training that might culminate in you doing more pull-ups or you doing uh, – I mean, we uh, shouldn't do plyometrics like – twice a day uh, <laughs> if you can handle it <laughs> i think that's a great marty gallagher point too because when people are having a flare or they develop a new pain i mean injuries are part of the game right and injuries are part of life but most so-called injuries aren't even injuries so you know yes lebron james um uh and donovan mitchell they badly injured their ankles and uh they had to take weeks and weeks off and when they came back they weren't 100 percent um but how many times does a basketball player turn their ankle? They're completely disabled for about 40 seconds. And, and they're, they can barely bear weight. And they have trepidation. And everybody's concerned. And then they start to walk with a limp. And then the ref blows the whistle. And the player doesn't come out of the game. Next thing you know, they're backpedaling. Then they're pivoting. They're changing direction. Next thing you know, there's a rebound, and they're on the offensive end, and they're sprinting. <laughs> then they have the ball, and they're doing magic with the ball. They're stopping on a dime, changing direction, reversing course, and there's no sequela. So for people, a lot of people will, will get hurt, and they assume there's damaged. They assume that hurt equals harm. And I think this is the number one thing that we want to move away from. And it's the number one thing that gets compounded by the desire to find the specific cause of musculoskeletal pain. Because people chase the scan. How can you know what's wrong without a scan? And the science is so clear that if we scan people that have no pain, false positive rate is like 50%. A little less in people under 50, a little more in people over 50. But the false positive rate is through the roof. And in young people, when there is a degenerative finding or a torn hip labrum or uh, 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 arthritic spur or a herniated disc in an asymptomatic 25 year old, the incredible news, the good news is that compared to people with pristine scans, that person, believe it or not, is less likely to develop symptoms in the future. So what does that tell us? It doesn't tell us scans are unimportant. Because if you have sciatica, I know your scan is positive. And if you don't get better with me and you don't get better with anti-inflammatories and epidurals, you are going to have a surgery and they'll know exactly what to do and the outcome will be very good. Do we want to avoid it? A hundred percent. But, but for most people, we don't need the scans. For most people, there are so many other things. It is so complex why a person has back pain, hip pain, shoulder pain. It is so complex. It could be tight hamstrings. It could be a stiff hip. It could be you're, you're not using your core. It could be your boom and bust weekend warrior who doesn't train for the game and just wants to compete and pretend they're 20 and, and doesn't recover. It could be that you're sedentary and you were told that you had damage and that, that, that you had wear and tear. And who are you at 50 years old to assume that you should still be doing things that you did when you were 30? Um, there are so many factors between flexibility, cardiovascular fitness, uh, strength, uh, coordination, uh, load management, being overprotective, that that actually is a blessing because the more complex, the more options. And if plan A doesn't work, we've got plan B. If plan B doesn't, B doesn't work, we've got plan C. What great coach isn't identified by the hallmark that they handle negative events in a superior fashion. They game plan on the fly, in the fourth quarter, on a timeout, in game six or game seven of a seven game series, at halftime, better than all the other coaches. Anybody can game plan for the first quarter. Who can game plan for the stress of being down at halftime or in the fourth quarter? So with our clients, it's the exact same way. Marty Gallagher always said, it's not about it's not about progress. Anybody can help you make progress. And we know from, from CrossFit and other approaches, random things work in the short term. But what can you do 
when a person has plateaued? How can you trigger progress when somebody is having recurrent flares, persistent problems, is in a rut? And, and I know that you spent a ton of time with Marty Ryan. What does that mean to you, that, that the hallmark of a, of a great program or an outstanding trainer or clinician is how they handle the plateaus? Yeah, that's, that's a great one because I have, uh, I mean, I have some people that have been with me for eight years and I have some people that, you know, new people come in every single day. So I've seen what the, the long term looks like and what the, the new people look like. And I think that's the key. I think being able to play toggle back and forth between specificity, which is sticking on a program, program long enough for it to work and variability is injecting a new stimulus when something has gotten stale is is the art of the science. It's the, um, it's what happens. It's what it, it gives people a positive experience when they do have a flare up or when uh, a spike in a change in their behavior occurs and then which leads to a spike in, in load somewhere that they're not ready for. And I think being able to identify that is the first, understanding that concept even exists is the first thing because you wouldn't even be able to recognize that someone flared from something like that unless you recognize that doing the same thing over and over has diminishing returns. Um, if you do it forever, doing too much, uh, too many random things leads to nothing at all. So knowing the sweet spot of that is, is uh, amazing. I think, I think um, the, the, I just w want to go back to the, the visualization that you, you so clearly made for us of the person who gets injured. Uh, it's a microcosm. They get injured on the court and they, all of a sudden they think they're, they're out of the, you know, they're, 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 their season's done, but then they start moving and they test it and all of a sudden they have all this confidence. That to me epitomizes what Gina's asking is, she said, uh, uh, Gina from, um, I think she's in Arlington now, one of, uh, uh, someone who's been training with, with you and with FPM and with Darius for a long time. Is, um, she asked, how do you, have you thought of a way to reach people that are intimidated, uh, um, that are intimidated walking into your gym slash clinic. And it's exactly what you described. It's giving them a positive experience of movement. Uh, a positive experience movement is, is not just telling someone that they're going to be okay. It's what you described. It's when you think things aren't going to be okay, but you actually feel the opposite. And then you have an explanation for why it's actually okay. Then all of a sudden you feel empowered. Then you feel like you can attack that plateau. Then you can feel like, you can move forward. And a lot of times we don't appreciate it when it happens without any guidance, but when it doesn't happen well, when no one's recognizing what's happening, which is what you're referring to about Marty uh, recognizing the plateau is that's when the downward spiral occurs. And that's when you need the reassurance. That's when the reactivation is, is something as simple as uh, your doctor told you not to squat because it's bad for your knees and just varying the squat to a, a version that's tolerable. It, it when, when they start to have, less pain or more mobility or hope with a squat when, when there's exactly the exact thing you they were told not to do all of a sudden you break this vicious, vicious cycle of um uh, plateauing of flaring of of no hope of, of chronic pain and then you you have a, a the start of reactivation which is really a plan on how to move forward and that plan uh, on how to move forward is really how you start to build out that program and that program yes you can you can fall back on templates that have worked for sports scientists in the past but it's really geared around those landmarks you were talking about what that person's for ready today and how more importantly i think what needs to be done with most people in terms of reactivation is to lay out expectations to lay out what they're going to encounter and then what to expect and how they know they're getting better how they know they're making progress and what not to worry about for me, I always tell clients, I'm here to interpret your pain for you because it's, mm. not, it's not enough to just say, oh, um, just do whatever doesn't hurt. Um, or, you know, you know, because then, then, you know, any little ache and pain, you stop and freeze and your whole entire life starts to, to pause. So I think, um, I think, you know, the plateau and, and, and jumpstarting that is a team thing. I think I'm over, I'm done with trying to, I've been a trainer and a clinician before. I'm done with trying to be both. I'm done with um, trying to train everybody or trying to clinician everybody. And I think the future is in breaking the silos, which is why I love what you teach and why I love this community is, is we can work together. Now, you know, we, we all are, are understanding the science and how to implement it now. I think 
the I think we once we understand reactivation, uh, reassurance, and reactivation, and how that's really about getting people started or or breaking people off their plateau and specificity of variability is it's not about me or what kind of training I want to do with you, but it's what are you ready for and and how does it get you to your goals? I love that, and I think what are you ready for is just like a powerful thought. It's a, it's an impetus because we don't want to give something too much too soon. We want to find the sweet spot. We want to, to, to give people a positive experience with movement. That safe starting point is, is, is such a beautiful uh, tee to put the ball on. We want to find the safe starting point. It doesn't mean um, that there won't be some pain. Like, like pain is like the NASDAQ. We want to focus on function and, and we want to reassure people that not every hurt equals harm. When we tell somebody that hurts don't do it, they become a fragilista. Obviously, we can use a traffic light metaphor. We can say red light, pain, avoid. Yellow, debrief with me. And I think the debrief is so important because people don't know. And so I, I believe, and I, I just had this come up today with one of my clients. Um, she had a pain with something that she was doing in the gym, in, her, in uh, uh, an adductor exercise, the Copenhagen adductor. And it kind of freaked her out. Like it was sort of like rolling an ankle. Like it went away quickly, but it was really disabling pain. And she needed that reassurance in real time. And I explained to her, I go, I go I'm glad that you, you, you reached out to me. She gave me an audio text message, one of these things. I don't even know how you do that. But, but, um, but I was so glad. And I said that, that once, I'm, once I'm working with you, it's collaboration. And what does that mean? Client-centered the client-centered approach is a community. It's an ecosystem. When I'm with you, the collaboration is concierge. I'm here for you when you're in Hawaii. I'm here for you on the weekends. I'm here for you on Sunday. I may not get back to you immediately, but I want you to know that you should contact me in real time. Don't wait till the next visit. Don't think that you have to do my online scheduling and schedule for a paid visit. When you see me the first visit after I've spent 90 minutes, you're now part of my community, part of this ecosystem. And I wanna know any questions you have in between sessions. That way, when I have a session with you, I can hit the ground running. And if you're already in our groups, then we don't have to worry that there's something going on in the back of your mind, something that is cropped up. We want you to be unfettered. We want you to be confident. Because confidence, like Michael Gervais says, is the cornerstone of great performance. And it comes from one place, what you say to yourself. So if you're feeling fragile because something happened you're not used to, how would you know that injuries are part of life and injuries are part of the game and that, you, that it's normal that you bounce back quickly? And that I want you, I'm encouraging you to debrief with me tomorrow. Why? Because as Rachel Balkovac said uh, in, our, in our high value webinar series in the Sunday morning programs, um, People aren't snowflakes. And so she has taught us, the first female in Major League Baseball from a coaching capacity, she has taught us from Carol Dweck, from Stanford University, all about growth mindset, that what does that mean for us in the musculoskeletal arena with respect to sustainable athleticism or healthy longevity? What it means is that people aren't snowflakes, that, that people should be onboarded to exposures to feared stimuli, to exposures to load that they can adapt to, that is the hardest thing they do well, that they should be exposed to things that make them have more confidence, that exceed their expectation, that builds what? That builds failure tolerance. We don't promise you won't have flares. We're not fixing anything. We're not fixing things so you can get on with your life. We're giving you confidence so you can get on with your life. We're reassuring you, like you said, Ryan, reactivating you because the motion is the lotion because if you want to move, you got to move. And we're explaining that, that wear doesn't equal tear, wear equals repair. It's wear and repair. It's getting back on the horse in a controlled way that we are helping you find that safe starting place. Yeah, I think, I think the confidence that you're talking about is highly underrated. And it's, it, it, it directly ties to the deep, debrief you're talking about because the confidence comes from the support. And when, when, and when you're the practitioner who is there 
to support someone as a member of someone's support team, not as traditional healthcare and fitness, I think is very transactional. It's, it's you show up in exchange for a treatment or a, for a uh, class or, you know, things. It's about the workout. It's not about the workout. It's about the support. It's about what you learn from your session. It's about, it's about how you unpack what you experienced. And when people feel like you have their back, then they'll have confidence. And, uh, especially in today's environment where, you know, uh, most doctors give you, you know, 10 minutes, they interrupt you in 10, 10 seconds. And, and in fitness, um, I think the equivalent is like, Hey, you know, you're doing the, the workout I want you to do. And you just kind of do what, you know, you, uh, whatever I do for myself is what you should be doing or my, whatever I learned in my latest class is what you should be doing because that's what I'm into. But it's not, it's not about that. It's about, explaining to people why we're doing what we're doing, explaining how it relates to what they're feeling, explaining to them how that leads to their goals and, and really um, uh, creating a, a community environment. And I'm so fortunate to be around so many instructors who do, do such a great job of that. Every day I work with uh, people on here like Jenna and Christine and Daniel and all these people who have mastered the, the group uh, environment. And I'm just, so I, I just t take it all in like they they create such a supportive community that, that when I show up, I have all this expertise and nobody even cares because everyone's just getting better without me, <laughs> which is what you want. Like you want people to just to feed off of each other and just to, to continue to, to support each other and push forward together. And you might need to redirect every once in a while, but it, it's it's just an incredible like uh, it's just an incredible um, new way, I think we should look at healthcare and fitness and, and uh, community instead of thinking this of this as, uh, you know, as uh, I guess a, a responsibility on one person. It's, it's, it's a social thing. It's a, it's a social determinant of health. It's a, it's more about, um, you know, really it's, is we want to try to get our group classes closer to activity than exercise, right? The only reason why we have to exercise so much is because today's society doesn't, have a need for us to you know farm work and whatever but but if we can create groups and communities then all of us will will uh it, that'll become our version of activity instead of a chore like exercise is seen right now well that that underscores the reality of why people are so overweight today and and why a 50 year old today has more osteoarthritis in their knees and hips than a 50 year old in the 1940s or in the industrial age or in prehistoric times it, it, fossil records show that cave people that, that made it to 50 um, uh, because uh, there wasn't a lot of available food sources, um, they naturally were wired to crave food, which now is, 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 is affecting us in a negative way. Um, and uh, they had to be very physically active. An older woman had to go and do all the gathering with the young girls. And they were the ones that were responsible for finding all the, the available food, especially when, when cave people, before they were, became hunters, they were gatherers. Um, and this, this required a lot of physical activity. And then, of course, they would conserve energy. So we were wired to be lazy and we were wired to crave food. And now those two traits lead to obesity because the food is right there. It's two steps away. It, they're super sized at 7-Eleven, there's McDonald's fast food, there's food in the cover, we have refrigeration. In the industrial age, we had, we know from the bones, there's less arthritis in 50 year olds. From the 1940s, we know there's less arthritis, we have the x-rays. So, so, so as Hawking said, the cause of most disease is we move, we move too little, we eat too much, and why it is more people don't realize this is beyond my understanding. So, so we kind of do understand it, it's behavioral. And that's why today, this, this IG Live, this Instagram Live is all about reconceptualizing beliefs. And one of the biggest things is we don't wanna shame people. Like it's not, like you say, it's not about exercise, it's about activity. It, it, our best test is tell us what your activity intolerance is. We knew 30 years ago to pivot from symptoms to activity intolerances relating to symptoms. Tell us about your lived experience. What can't you do that you want to do? Where do you see yourself in the future? What are you afraid of losing? And so we can reverse engineer. A 90-year-old needs to be able to squat. We have a timed squat test for 15 seconds, getting up and down from a chair without hand assist. And that gives us the biggest window 
uh, as to your, uh, your resilience for, for independent functioning, for avoiding assisted living. If we look at 75 year olds, we know that falls are not accidents, they're incidents. And, and the, 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 the rate of falls since 2000 is up 400%, not because we have more older people, it's per capita. So what can we do? Well, we wanna help people so they can get up and down from the floor. Our 75 year olds are afraid if they fall, they can't get up. And we know that that's not just about mobility, it's about strength, it's not about strength even, it's about power. To prevent a fall going downstairs requires speed of contraction. So it's about power. So we know 50 year olds, they need glutes and abs, they need hip mobility, they need shoulder mobility. So we've reverse engineered all that into our programming. That's what Christine and Linda, Linda are talking about in their JOSPT podcast. That's criteria-based group training. It's about the fundamentals. And, and I think we've learned so much about this from people like Dan Path, because Dan says, what is my screen? My screen is, is watching you do a, a movement prep, watching you warm up for the activities of the day. And I watch how you prepare with incredible attention detail. And then we look at Mike Boyle and Mike says his, his parents that have a hockey kid or a lacrosse kid or a tennis kid or a cross country kid are, are all wondering, why, why is my cross country kid, kid doing the same thing as that football wide receiver? How can that be the right thing? And Mike has to explain that the basics are the basics. We're working on giving a foundation. And so what we know is squat, lunge, hinge, push, pull, carry is scalable. 90 year olds need to squat. 75 year olds need single leg bias, they need to lunge. Uh, 50 year olds need pillow prep and, and, and active mobility. This is for everybody, whether you're a shoulder or a knee or a hip. And what an exciting time. But to your point, Ryan, about social determinants, like my God, what, what an aha, that it's not about lifestyle. And this has come through on Twitter in the last two days. Lifestyle's a Madison Avenue thing. Lifestyle is a branding thing. We don't want to turn promoting physical activity into a lifestyle issue. Then it becomes something for those people who can afford a personal trainer. And that's why we're pushing group, but even pushing group isn't really getting to the root of the problem. The root of the problem is what zip code do you live in? And can we, um, can we leverage our influence, our circle of influence, for policy changes, for green spaces, for, for no car zones, uh, for more human locomotion in cities, uh, for uh, safe areas for poor people, for low income housing near places of employment. Um, we need to change the whole discussion from the big global picture and not shame people, not, start, not get back to New Year's resolutions again. Um, it's not about willpower because we are wired for being lazy. We are wired for, for craving food because most of our existence was as cave people when that served survival. Now it's all right there. And being lazy makes us fat and overeating makes us fat. We don't wanna make this about lifestyle. We wanna realize that there are much bigger psychological issues. We wanna find the behavioral economics nudges. And that's why another thing that we focus on a lot is gamification. And that's why community is so important. So I just love, Ryan, that you pivoted this conver conversation in the first minutes away from an emphasis on clinician, away from an emphasis on one-on-one -on -one training to community. Yeah, I think, I think uh, sometimes when you think about what you, know, you just talked about, it's a little overwhelming, but I think together our community has more influence so i'm glad that it is about this community that's here and and uh you know there's so many things you just spoke about that i wanted to to speak about but uh i think there's probably that's probably uh i think that's the high point is really together we're better than than if we're all trying to solve this on our own and i think um uh yeah it's it's just uh, an amazing opportunity to have you know passionate people who really want to help people together here with us from all over and uh you know it's it's great that there are people who want to be mentored to see how we can affect people better to so that we can speak the same language so that we can learn about how to profile people which is really quickly understanding them so that we can intervene uh in the most efficient way for them about them in a person-centered manner and then that's not enough is 
it's to be able to take that information and communicate it to someone else in this community and say, hey, I want you to work with them. Um, you know, the craziest thing happened when you started teaching uh, seminars in New York when I, when I started hosting you here is that people in, in our community of, of independent trainers and physical therapists and chiropractors uh, started referring clients to each other. And that's, um, that's like an unseen thing because it's a very dog eat dog world in, in independent training and physical therapy and, and all that stuff. And so this message is definitely, I think, resonating with people in this community is uh, just an opportunity for us to all make a difference and be part of something bigger. So I love uh, that. Man. Yeah. And I, I think it's just the first step. We, we, we mentor together. We, we learn how to speak the same language. We trust each other with our clients, our, our, um, the, uh, our name, our, our, uh, you know, our family members and things like that. And then, and then from there, I think, I think we, we can help each other. We can help each other. It's just easier to do it together than, and there's, there's unlimited amounts of people who need our help. And that's an unfortunate thing. And, and that's why we, I think, um, you know, I'm so happy that during the pandemic, we were able to turn such a bad situation into a positive and, and leverage virtual leverage IG live. We, we struggled so much trying to figure out how to do this the other day, <laughs> uh, but, but trying to try, you know, we were forced to solve it. We were, we were like, you know what? I don't like this, but I have to solve it. We solved it. And we solved it. And now we can all, we can interact with our Australia right now, uh, the UK all over. And it's, uh, you know, it's just, it's just a fortunate situation. And I'm glad. Uh, now that we're able to to meet again, to travel again, that we can do live seminars to break this down even further and to to give um, you know tangible ways for us to do this and and then uh, yeah and just keep this thing going and let, and and just be a, a beacon for those who who want to break the status quo who don't want to accept all the nonsense that happens in healthcare don't want to uh, try to. Uh, solve this marketing and business uh, uh, problem that we all have to solve. And why, why do we all have to do that individually? Why don't we just work together? I love that. And we are, we are uh, uh, a community of outliers. I don't think any of the people that are, that are listening to us, whether they're from Australia or South Korea or Europe or all over North America, uh, I don't think any of them are people that uh, aren't passionate. Uh, we're seekers after after um, growth and we accept having to update our priors i used to believe in corrective exercise uh i learned that that it was more about creating an environment and letting people problem solve letting people learn on their own and make mistakes i, I never would have dreamed that i always thought that they needed me and like i could assess them and find out what was wrong and then find the specific cause and then tell them what's non-negotiable about exactly what to do. And in reality, what's non-negotiable is what you're saying, Ryan. We should work together. We should learn together. We should have an open mind, as Dr. Levitt said, for new ideas that sometimes shows what we thought or believed before was wrong. And, and it's that humility, I think, that unites the first principles of movement community. We want to integrate. It's not one way or the other. Uh, every system out there has, has benefit for people. Um, we want to deploy whatever works. And you said it about kettlebells. Like, like it's important to have optionality um, uh, because a person will maybe not have access to a tool or they'll get hurt using one tool or one tool will be um, uh, something that they master and now they, they, they can learn something more. Uh, to become more flexible and agile and adaptable by playing with the landmine or the dumbbell or the barbell or body weight or just going out. And, and I have trainers as, as clients of mine where I'm like, go for a hike, walk your dog. Like, don't train, deload. Um, and Hank Cranoff, one of both of our favorite sprint coaches in the world, this is a big thing for him is the deload and not training people, going for a hike with his great sprinters. And he's had the most... Uh, uh, he's had the, the 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 most meddled woman in the history of Olympics as his client, and that's that's something that he learned. So I think we can learn that from him. And of course, Hank also says quite elegantly what what's become sort of the credo of our mentorship. And Laura is here, Laura Latham, who heads our mentorship. Uh, uh, the profile comes first; the program comes after. 
profile your client first, then build the program. And that's what we teach in our mentorship. We have a mentorship starting in August. It can be different in 5.0 than 4.0, 3.2, because we're coming out of the pandemic. We're going to have fewer Zooms because people are getting out in the world. We're going to lean into our resources and self-directed learning and our chat. Our chat is going to come forward because you can get on the chat anytime that's convenient for you, whether you're in Indonesia where it's three in the morning when we're having the live Zoom. And we're also probably going to do live Zooms midweek at a different time. So we're pivoting and we can't wait to just meet together. In Chicago, we'll meet together again in October. Um, and, and that's something that, you, that you've really contributed so much, Ryan, is building the community of people that should be in competition with one another. But they're meeting together to learn together. So when we have a, a room of people, I love it because our room is not just chiropractors. I'm a chiropractor. It's not just PTs, you're a PT. The majority are, are coaches, are trainers, because movement is medicine. And I have them stand up and then I have the PTs raise their hand and the chiros raise their hand. And I look at the PTs and chiros and I go, the trainers, they're your teachers this weekend because the only people we can trust to put movement and exercise first. Mm. The rest of us were so corrective. We, we go back to our modalities and our manual therapy, but who can we trust? Who really is totally committed to exercise as medicine. And if there's an online coach in the room who does group, next time I'm having them stay standing because they're the one I wanna learn from the most, like a Lauren Kansky, like a community of 500 people. Like, like, like I wanna learn how to do that. Mm. Any That's final thoughts? I'm gonna let you take us out, Ryan. Give us the, give us the last 30 seconds. Oh man, no, I'm, I'm excited. Uh, yeah. It's the, the updated mentorship, the, the in-person learning and learning from, you know, people who are showing up to supposedly learn from us is I can't wait for all of it. It's, it's been too long since we've all been able to travel. It's been too long since we've all been able to connect in person. So uh, I love the, the upgrades. I love uh, the fact that we're reconnecting all of our past mentees in, on a board and, and working together to help each other on, and, and for us to, to help with hard cases and share our experiences so we can all update our priorities even faster and make a bigger impact overall. Well, we've been, we've been so blessed. And, and this idea of community, what you've done in New York has been amazing. And, and you know, we've had courses all over the world, but I feel like, I feel like uh, uh, I'm lucky to have you and Laura working with me and Chad Buell is with us too here. Uh, our faculty has just been amazing. Uh, we, we just have so much to learn and we wanna challenge the status quo. We wanna address the worldwide inactivity crisis. We wanna bridge the chasm from evidence into whatever environment you have, online, gym or clinic. Uh, we wanna promote sustainable athleticism and healthy longevity. And, and we're just scratching the surface because we know there are so many social determinants of health and we really, we really are limited and constrained in what we can do to address that. But, but that's on our radar. Like, like we have people now going into population health. We have people going to Duke. We have people dropping out of chiropractic school. We have people going to Harvard School of Population Health. They're gonna be addressing these things and we're gonna stay in touch with all those people. So let me thank everybody and uh, we hope to see you, see you down the road real soon. Yeah, we'll do it again soon. Thank you. All right, thanks, Craig. Thanks everybody.